Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, that's a clip from the show Seinfeld, which is a favorite of mine. And uh, whenever I was going over with Shrum what videos we could possibly put at the beginning, that was one of his suggestions. And I couldn't pass it up because it's, it's a good one. But it is related, so just hang with me for a little while. We will get to that in a little bit. But it is uh, great to be back with you. I was uh, up here for Youth Sunday back in May, and while I can honestly say I never expected that they would ask me to do that, I definitely wasn't expecting to be asked to come speak again. But that being said, I hope you all had the opportunity to be here last week to hear Pastor Chris give us the first three points for this two-week series, Changing My Spiritual Direction. If you didn't get the chance to hear that one, don't worry. I'm going to spend the first part of today's message kind of doing a recap of what was covered last week. So our vision at LUMC is what? If you don't know it, there are signs on pretty much every doorway in the church because we really want to get our vision focused. It is to make mature mobilize and multiply disciples in our community and beyond, right? So in this two-week series, we are going to be focusing on that second M, which is maturing. We need to mature as disciples of Jesus Christ. And for those of us who have accepted Jesus as our Lord, the Holy Spirit resides within us. And so we are all going through this continuous process of sanctification from the moment we accept Jesus as our Lord and receive the Holy Spirit in our lives until the moment he calls us home. We are all going through this process. And for each of us, it looks different. We may be at different points throughout the process. We may be moving at different paces from one another, but we are all being sanctified. Now, sanctification sounds like this big, scary church word, but it's really quite simple if we think of it like this. It is just the process of being made holy through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are all being conformed to the image and character of Jesus Christ through this process of sanctification. It was, on, it was once illustrated for me like this. Uh, show of hands, who has heard of or is familiar with the Renaissance sculptor painter Michelangelo? Okay, he painted the Sistine Chapel. He is also very well known for his statue of David, uh, David from the Old Testament. Somebody once asked Michelangelo, they, they were just in awe of this accomplishment. They said, how was it possible for you to make this beautiful piece out of just a solid block of marble. And Michelangelo, he responded in this way. He said, I simply removed everything that was not David. Now, that sounds like a really unhelpful answer for somebody to be asking Michelangelo. It doesn't help us in, in that context, but it can help us conceptualize this process of sanctification. That's exactly what God does to us through the Holy Spirit, by his power and our cooperation, he removes everything in our lives that does not look like, sound like, act like Jesus Christ. We are being conformed to his image by scraping away, removing everything that doesn't reflect the character of Jesus. Now let me say that again, and let's pay careful attention to the roles that are filled in this process. God, by his power, is changing us with our cooperation, okay? So he brings the power, we bring the cooperation. God is in the business of changing lives. I know Pastor Chris says that all the time, and it's so true. He removes the stuff in our lives that doesn't look like or act like Christ. It is our job to be willing participants in that process, to cooperate with what the Holy Spirit is doing. So we got five points that we're going to go through to understand this process of changing our spiritual direction. Again, the first three points for this morning are a recap from what Pastor Chris shared last week, and then we'll dive into the last two points. Number one, we have to recognize that each of our spiritual lives are journeys, okay? This is not a one-time event. This is not a singular occurrence. It is a continual process that requires patience in a world that demands instant satisfaction, gratification, deliverance of whatever we want. It's right here at our fingertips, on our phones, on our computers. We want it right now, but it requires patience. 
Philippians 1.6 says this, He who began a good work in you, that's God, who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. So God began the work in you, okay, that is your salvation, your saving, and he's going to continue that work in you, that is sanctification. Your spiritual life is a journey, and I desperately pray that each of us has turned our hearts toward God through Jesus. And that brings us to point number two. We need to set our sights on the final destination. And that final destination for us is holiness. And we are commanded by Jesus to be set apart from the rest of the world. Now, remember, this is not set above. We are not above the rest of the world looking down at all those pitiful sinners because guess what? We are also pitiful sinners that are in need of God's grace. So we are not set above them, but we are set apart from them. And people should be able to see a difference in the way that we live our lives by how we are set apart for holiness. And this is outlined in the scripture time and time again. Here in Leviticus 20, it says this, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, because I am the Lord your God. Keep my decrees and follow them, I am the Lord who makes you holy. Again, it is his power to change our lives that enables us to be set apart. One of the most influential passages of scripture in my life comes from Proverbs 4.23. It says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Some translations say that it is the wellspring of life, that everything that is in your person, in your heart, will bubble out of you in that way. And as the Holy Spirit changes our inner being, as he changes our hearts, he changes who we are on the inside, and then our actions will follow that. You see that? You change what's on the inside, you change your heart, and then your actions will flow from that. And that is not always an easy thing to do, which is what brings us to our third point from last week. We need to ask God to help us remove the roadblocks. This is an essential part of our individual spiritual journeys because all of us have unique and personal challenges in our lives that cause us in the flesh to fight against the working of the Holy Spirit. These challenges come in all shapes and sizes. Some of us, many of us, in effect, I would, I would think, have more than one of these challenges, and they can be anything from natural inclinations toward a sinful desire For others, it may be a trauma that you've experienced in your past and you are having difficulty moving past that or forgiving people who are involved. That could be others. That could even be yourself. It may be an addiction to a dependency on substances or sexual sin, materialism, pride, entertainment. Anything like that could be a roadblock for you and for me. Your roadblock could be struggling to accept the fact that anyone, including God, could ever love you for the things that you have done before. And if that is you this morning, please hear me when I say that I love you. I do. And more importantly, God loves you. Despite our sinfulness, he loves us so much that he sent his son for us. And I know one thing for certain, every one of us has a roadblock that comes in some shape or form, and you oftentimes will already know what that is. I've counted up my roadblocks. Believe me, they're not pretty. But I have, through the power of the Holy Spirit and by God's grace, been able to move past them. And I know that God is bigger than any roadblock that we could possibly have. And we need to remember that. Your God is bigger than than the roadblocks that are placed in front of you. And if we humbly ask him to remove what we cannot, then we will find ourselves moving closer and closer to him in our personal relationships. So we must recognize that our spiritual life is a journey. We have to set our sights on the destination, which is holiness, and we need to ask God to remove our roadblocks. That brings us to our first new point for this week, and your outline is point number four. We need to learn how to refuel. Okay, some of you know this. I work at a museum pretty close by. I'm the museum manager at the Lincoln Highway Experience, 
which is a museum dedicated to the history of the Lincoln Highway, which goes right through Latrobe on what is now Route 30. Well, not downtown Latrobe, but it goes by Latrobe. It is the first coast-to-coast -coast road in America from New York City to San Francisco. And when it was built, it was the first paved road across America in a time when a lot of dirt roads were around. But as you go further east from here, once you get to Lachlan Town and beyond, you hit this really challenging geographic feature for automobiles to travel on. What is that? Mountains. You go like this. It's, if you see a topographical chart of the elevations traveling east of here, it looks like the end of a buzzsaw. I mean, and, and we're talking about vehicles that are Model A's, Model T's, Packard's, like very old vehicles that did not have the, the brakes and the engines that we have today. And so as early travelers are going up and down those ridges, they realized that they would be overwhelmed if they did not stop at the top of the mountain to check the brakes before going back down again, to refuel the engine to make sure they can make the next climb to let the radiators cool. And so as you travel the Lincoln Highway, you'll often find a lot of mountaintop roadhouses going across the Alleghenies for that very reason. Early travelers recognized that if they did not take the time to refuel and to check and make sure that everything was going okay, they might just find themselves in a very uncontrolled descent. And that also ties in slightly with the Seinfeld video. I just couldn't pass up the chance because it's just a funny clip where they are pushing the limits. They're trying to see how far they can go without stopping for gas, to see how far they can get the needle to dip below E until they were stranded on the side of the road. But if we want to have a successful spiritual journey, we need to stop and refuel. We can't allow ourselves to get distracted by the scenery or by the kids arguing in the back seat. We have to focus on the destination, again, which is holiness. For some of us, the reason we don't stop to refuel is because we feel the need to make it on our own. I don't need anybody else's help. I don't trust anyone to give me the help that I need. I can do it by myself. My friends, we have got to prioritize filling our tanks. Because if we don't take the time to do that every single day, I guarantee you, one of these days, you're going to wake up in the morning and you're going to find yourself on the side of the road without any gas in your tank. You're going to be wishing that you had stopped to refuel. But what does that look like as followers of Christ? To put it simply, refueling is taking the time to get connected with God. We have to make time in our journey to be intentional with how we spend time with the Lord. If you look at our mission statement as a church, you'll see that developing biblical disciples through intentional relationships is foundational to how we want to achieve our vision. But why is that? Why is it so important, that intentional relationship aspect? Isn't it because one of the very best ways, the best way, to maintain a relationship with God is through intentionality? If we take the time to listen to one another, to communicate with one another, to share our griefs, to share our joys we will all grow together in one united community. And that relationship between believers reflects a proper relationship with the Lord. To make time in our lives to communicate with Him, to thank and praise Him for all that He is doing in our lives, to listen to what He's saying to our lives through reading His Word and through prayer, giving Him our deepest hurts our deepest fears, our greatest questions, and quieting our minds for even just a portion of our day will help us to build that intentional relationship with God. Having intentional relationships with other by the power of the Holy Spirit leads us toward an intentional relationship with God. And I think King David had a very good understanding of this idea when he wrote Psalm 23. He writes this, he, that's God, he renews my strength, he renews 
my strength. He guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. That's from the New Living Translation in in the New International Version. It puts it this way. He refreshes my soul. He refreshes my soul. And those of you who know your hymns from Great is Thy Faithfulness, it quotes Lament. I just thought of this one. In Lamentations, it talks about how his mercies are new to us every morning. Can you imagine if you woke up feeling the renewing of his mercies because you take the time to seek him at the very beginning of every day? Not to knock the folks that like to read toward the end of the day, I personally find it is best to start out my day with the Lord. It orients my heart toward him and everything that I do following that time that I spend with him. And it's interesting in Psalm 23 that just a few verses later, David describes this feeling of his soul being refreshed and his strength being renewed when he writes, my cup overflows. My cup overflows. Can you imagine if we start every day with our tank overflowing? If we, if we take the time to renew our strength through his word, to meditate with him. Now, some of you, I'm sure, know exactly that feeling that David is describing here. It's a feeling of complete blessing, of overwhelming desire to be in relationship with him. You have received unimaginable and unmerited favor, and so you cannot help but turn to the God of blessing in that time and to be in deep intimacy with him. It is a feeling of joy that comes when you refuel every day. You make that a priority and your tank overflows. But on the other hand, I'm confident that for some of you, you have not yet experienced that joy of walking with him every day. Perhaps you are in a spiritual season where you are having difficulty feeling the nearness of God. You are having difficulty feeling that he is right there next to you the entire time. It is not just a good idea to spend time in God's word every day. It is essential for your survival in this world. And let me tell you something. I have been there. I have been in both of those places, all three really, where I feel the blessing of intimacy with him, where I maybe have not felt it in a long time. But just remember that when you are feeling far from him, It's not because he is far from you. It is because we have to turn our hearts and orient them toward holiness. And as we do that, as we spend time intentionally with him, we refuel and we see that he is right there with us all along. I have a friend uh, that I knew in high school who's in college now. And uh, I was talking with her recently. And like, unfortunately, so often happens with people of that age group as they go away to college, she started to drift away from her habits of reading scripture, of spending time in prayer, of making it a priority to visit uh, with the congregation every Sunday and to worship together. One day we were catching up, and as she was talking about her experiences in college, she, she confessed to me that she didn't feel very good about how things were going in her life that she had not made it a priority to walk with Jesus every day. I asked her how she was planning to change that, what she, what she was doing. She said, truth be told, I really haven't been. And I think that might be the problem. And I said, kinder than this, but do you think? Do you think that might be the problem? If you spent your entire childhood in church, you grew up in a faithful home, and you had these practices in place... But when you went off to college, you fell out of those habits. Is it any wonder why you feel like you're stranded on the side of the road calling somebody up for a can of gas to get you to the next exit? So how do we do it? How do we refuel? Well, I've already touched upon a couple of these points. We need to pray. We need to spend time in the Word. Coming on Sunday and listening to me, listening to Pastor Chris to Shrum, to Travis. No matter how, how eloquently we may try to say something, no matter how inspired our words may be, it's not going to be enough to just come every Sunday. You have to make that time for an intimate relationship 
with God by reading his word, by asking the Holy Spirit to illuminate the chapters that you're reading, by starting your reading time with prayer and finishing it in personal reflection. How can I apply what I've read this morning to my life? But outside of prayer and scripture, something that I've found to be very useful is to meditate on this question, to ask yourself, what stirs my affections for the Lord? What habits bring me closer to him whenever I put them into practice? What decisions draw me nearer to him? What decisions that I avoid prevent me from drifting away from him. Now, me personally, I grew up in a family that was very musical. We, we played instruments, we sang, we did all kinds of activities that involved music. And for, that, me, for me still today, that is influential in how I posture my heart, how my affections are stirred for Jesus. Spending time alone listening to musical psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing along with them in the car, in the shower when nobody's listening, and sometimes when people are listening as well, is something that I feel puts my heart in a position of humility and one of obedience. But that might be different for some of you. For some of you, it may be spending time outdoors. It may be gardening It may be visiting with others who you know are in need. It could be hosting a party for fellow believers or a get-together. There are so many things that we can do that can spur us on in our relationships with God. And for many of us here, I know that service is one of those things. And I know it because I see week in and week out the faithful followers of this community in this congregation, serving one another in so many different capacities. And I would be afraid to name any of them for fear of leaving any of those positions out, but it's often the ones that we don't even know are going on that are the hearts with the most service capacity in them. So, you have to spend some time in prayer and in Scripture. You have to know how to stir your affections for Jesus. But we can see the result of being refueled every day in Second Peter chapter 1. It says this, As we know Jesus better, his divine power gives us everything we need for living a godly life. So make every effort to apply these promises to your life. It doesn't say make an occasional effort. It doesn't say once a week when you come to church make that effort. Make it a daily effort. Make every effort to apply these promises to your life. Then your faith will produce a life of moral excellence. A life of moral excellence leads to knowing God better. Knowing God leads to self-control. Self-control leads to patient endurance, and patient endurance leads to godliness. Godliness leads to love for other Christians, and finally, you will grow to have genuine love for everyone. Now that sounds pretty darn good to me, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound like the way we want to live our lives, like the way that God has called us to live them in the first place? And he's laid it out for us right here. We need to make every effort to apply the promises of Scripture to our lives. We also need to make sure that we do not allow pride to take root in our heart through this process. We need to resist the sinful inclination to say, well, I spend an hour in quiet time every day. I spend two hours in prayer all the time. Those are wonderful things. But we have to remember that it's God who supplies the power. We supply the cooperation. We cannot draw ourselves closer to God. We can only open our arms and allow His Spirit to do the work. We cannot allow the pride of refueling to take root because what happens then is we start to set ourselves above when we need to simply set ourselves apart. That's so, so important. This always will take place in the context of community and discipleship. Every single community of Christ is essential for individual spiritual growth because the sin in my life that I might not see Shelby might see, 
my parents might see, Travis might see, the people who are closest to us in this community have a better angle at seeing the things that maybe we are not so aware of. I know that my sister Reagan has done this for me before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not going to tell you what, but, uh, but it certainly happened. And uh, we need people in our lives that are willing to bring these up to us, to bring these issues that are roadblocks that maybe we don't even see. We can ask God to remove the roadblocks in our lives, but if we are unaware that something in our life is a roadblock, then how will we even think to ask for its removal? This always takes place in the, t- in the context of community. Our sanctification requires intentional relationships with one another. It requires an intentional relationship with the Lord. So our fifth point for changing our spiritual direction is this. Pause along the way to celebrate the progress. Sometimes as Christians, we doubt whether or not God is actually sanctifying us, whether we are actually making any progress in our spiritual walk, whether we are being conformed to the image and character of Christ. So when we look at our lives right now, as we look at them as they are, and we see the wrinkles that haven't yet been ironed out, we don't uh, see the progress that's being made. When we see all the problems we thought would have been solved by now, all the problems and bad habits that we haven't quite kicked to the curb, it is difficult to celebrate and acknowledge how much work the Spirit has already done. Like everyone else, I have my own sin struggles that I am still working through, and at times I get really mad about them. I get impatient. Why hasn't this been, this been dealt with yet? Why haven't I been able to permanently change the thought processes and the habits that I know keep me from a right relationship with God? Yet if I stop for a moment to think about where I was just a year ago, I cannot help but be humbled by the mountains that God has moved in my life. We need to pause, reflect, and celebrate that progress that we have made. Psalm 40 says this, O Lord my God, you have done many miracles for us. Your plans for us are too numerous to list. If I tried to recite all your wonderful deeds, I would never come to the end of them. I think if we all took a moment to reflect on the ways that God has changed our lives, we would realize just how many miracles he has done. We would see the plans too numerous to count. We would run out of paper before we could list his blessings. Again, for each of us, this progress might look different because our individual challenges are going to look different. Maybe you struggle with alcohol abuse, but you don't feel the desire to drink every night like you used to. Celebrate that. That is God changing your heart. Maybe you have a history of pornography addiction, and it's been going on for years and years. But this week, you made the choice to keep your eyes on the bumper in front of you rather than looking at the billboard advertising the local adult store. Perhaps you've struggled with gossiping and you're starting to think about how your words might make others feel if they were in the room with you. Celebrate these things. That's progress that God is making happen in your lives. Maybe you struggle with envy and you resent the progress that has been made in other people's lives. But this week you've decided to celebrate those people. Celebrate that. (laughs) That's progress that God is making in your life. I know that in my life I have a tendency to procrastinate. I put things off until the last minute. So whenever I finished this message on Monday, you can imagine that I celebrated that change in my life. So here's our homework for this week. When we find ourselves in a difficult situation, and I'd like each of you to think about this. Pause in the midst of that difficult situation. Because I know in my personal life, when I find myself in a difficult spot, that is often when God makes the biggest changes happen. 
God works in difficult situations. He takes bad circumstances and turns them for good. Let's say, for example, you had a tough day at work, and there's nothing that you want to do more than get home, change into your pajamas, heat up some leftovers, and put on your favorite show. But there's only one problem. The car in front of you goes 10 miles an hour under the speed limit the entire way home. You get home to find that your spouse has eaten the last of the leftovers before taking the kids to soccer practice. Your family member who you share a Netflix account with is watching something right now so you can't watch the show that you wanted to watch. Okay, so maybe there's more than just one problem here. But it's important to stop, to pause in that moment, and to take some time to pray. Say something like this. God, I know that you're using this situation to challenge me, so would you please help me to respond in a way that honors you. A good metric by which we can see some of the progress that's being made is something that we spent several weeks talking about last month, the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So when you think back about where you were in your life before you accepted Jesus Christ, are you more loving now? than you were then? Are you more joyful? More peaceful? More patient? Are you more kind and good and faithful and gentle and self-controlled? Chances are, the answer is yes. It may be by a small margin or maybe by miles, but I'm willing to bet that everyone in this room has made progress and has progress to celebrate in at least one of those qualities. So let's make it personal as we wrap up. Where are you in this journey? If you've already committed your life to Christ, take a moment to think about that. Maybe you want to star the point that you find yourself on right now. Are you thinking of walking out of here today thinking that nothing in your life has to be changed? Well, think again. Remember, this is a journey. It's not a one-time event. Are you feeling overwhelmed by the task of becoming holy, of being sanctified? Recognize that it's God who brings the power. It's you who brings the cooperation. Allow him into your life and he will change it. Are you parked in front of a roadblock with the emergency brake on because you can't see a way around it? Ask God to remove that and keep moving toward Jesus. Do you feel that your tank is empty? Spend time in prayer. Spend time in the Word. Learn the habits that stir your affection for Jesus and fill your tank up and make that a priority every day. You feel like you've been at this a really long time and you're not really seeing the progress that is being made. Pause. Reflect. Look in the rearview mirror and see just how far you have come by his grace and power. Some of you might not have even started the journey yet. And if that's you, I pray that you take the time today to ask Jesus into your life so that you can begin that process of change. It is such a powerful thing The God who changes lives being invited into your life. Maybe you're still questioning the whole Jesus thing. Ask someone. Ask them personally what has had an effect in your life. What area has been affected by your relationship with Jesus? If you've never committed your life to a relationship with Christ, I would encourage you, would you do that this morning? Would you do that this morning? Don't put it off any longer. Your life can begin to change today. And I hope that if you came as a seeker, you would leave as a believer, that you would that this would be true of you, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, they are not the same anymore. For the old life is gone and a new life has begun. So, may the journey begin for you if you have not yet begun. And if you have started your journey, may you faithfully continue 
in that. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you work in our lives, that we can be different people because of your grace, because of your power to change our lives. God, we have a need to change, to grow, to be different. Would you break our hearts of stone, give us hearts of flesh that we can understand your word, that we might humbly submit to your standards, to your way, to your truth, to your will for us, that we would be constantly changed to reflect the likeness of Jesus Christ. Would you do your work in us so that we might be different people than we were when we came in this place today? We pray this in your Son's name.